Begin in verse 1 and read all the way down to verse 13. But my main text this morning, honestly, uh, really trying to concentrate on verses uh, 9 through 13. But all of it just seems to fit together so perfectly. So I can't help myself, you know. And all the Word of God is perfect, is entire, and uh, you know, it, it'll make us what we ought to be. It'll make us perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So verse 1, it says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold... I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that know thee not shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, for he, the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Now, before I move on just a little bit to context, I'll, I'll clarify this a little bit later on, but what comes before this? You know, before Isaiah 54, what happens in Isaiah 53? This is about the Savior. When he begins to talk about, you know, when, when, when they shall know thee and run to thee because of the Lord thy God, for he's the Holy One of Israel, what he's saying is when the millennial reign becomes along, we're all going to be running and rushing to the Lord. But look at verse 6. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. Aren't you glad for that? And to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. I know He's done that for me. For many, th- for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your way, my, my ways, your ways, my my ways, saith the Lord. Wow, I got that twisted. You know, our ways are to do just like it says in verse two to spend money on that which is not bread and the labor for that which satisfies not, but. His way, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, that shall not, that shall not return unto me void. I mean, that sounds definite, doesn't it? But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Kind of reminds you when Jesus Christ is heading to the cross, and the people are crying out, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And the Pharisees rebuke and say, "Don't, Don't let your disciples say that. And he said, if these should hold their peace, the rocks would cry out. But he says in verse 13, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and for an everlasting sign. And it shall not be cut off. I don't know about you, but growing thorns and bristles and uh, every one of those, I had those on the farm. I'd rather have the fir trees and the, and the myrtle trees and everything else. Those, those are more beautiful. Let's pray this morning as we get into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this time. And Lord, I pray You would just guide me and direct me uh, as I begin to preach Your Word. Lord, we're so thankful for Your Word and what it promises to accomplish. And Lord, we know it accomplishes exactly what You send it to. When You said that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, many of us have that testimony. When you said that, uh, you know, you're going to be with us, world without end. You say that in Matthew 28 when you give the Great Commission. And that's always been true when we look at the missionaries who've been there on the field and they've served you for many different years. And Lord, we're thankful for your word that accomplishes exactly what you please. We know that your word always works. And so Lord, I pray you would just help me. Lord, you know I need your help. Lord, did you would just fill my mouth with your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Christ has created a world rich full of diversity, you know. And people come from all over the world and they have all these different worldviews because you know what, man, that's pretty smart, aren't we? And uh, they have everything figured out and they go searching and looking and trying to find the truth everywhere. But what Jesus says, search the Scriptures for they are they which testify of me. You'll find eternal life when you search the Scriptures and you find out that I'm the Savior of men. And I like that. But many, many, many people are searching, searching far and wide for the truth. Now God, in His wonderful promise, has sent his Christians to go spread the gospel, to be salt and light in this world. In the early days of the book of Acts, you remember Peter gets up and he preaches that great sermon on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved and it's a glorious day and they're rejoicing. There's a little bit of trouble that rises up amongst the, 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 the Greek women during that time and they get six, uh, seven different uh, deacons during that time. And uh, things are going well for a while, but what happens? I mean, it's one persecution right after another. And I mean, they face the Sanhedrin. They tell them, we don't want you to teach and preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't want to hear about the resurrection from the dead. We don't want to hear that name Jesus. And, and there begins to be persecution arising just out of, it seems, nowhere from the religious establishment during that time. And then we get over to Acts chapter 9 and we learn about a guy by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And Saul, I mean nobody, went, I mean he goes persecuting the church into the ends of the world and what God is doing in His divine plan is scattering His people far and wide to get the gospel out. And He does that by persecution in order for them to, to tell the whole world about Jesus Christ and what He has done. I, I like what's been going on here recently. You know, it's, uh, it seems like today, whereas it used to be persecution and, and sending forth the Christians into the world to bring the, the gospel message to them so that they might get saved by the grace of God, that, that was wonderful. But it seems like now that God has kind of reversed the course a little bit, so to speak. You know, you go up to Charlotte, North Carolina, or you go up to where uh, my mother-in-law and them are, up in Massachusetts Heritage. She, she always tells me about the diversity that's there in the church. And she says, you have so many cultures and different backgrounds. and very, they, They've come to us. You know, if I would ask somebody, uh, you know, not too long ago, or even today, probably more so today, I guess, but I ask one of you and I say, well, who wants to be a missionary to Afghanistan? I, I doubt very seriously that I probably wouldn't get too many hands. Uh, we might get some people that have surrendered to missions and say, oh yes, I believe in missions and I, I want to complete the Great Commission and I'll do my best and I'll send the money. But Afghanistan, man, that's, they shoot Christians over there. Or maybe one of the other countries. Well, the great news about that is, is he's brought those in Afghanistan over here and just landed a hundred, I don't know how many thousands of them. So how do you reach the people of Afghanistan? I mean, since Christians are not going, he brought them to our doorstep, did he not? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the glad tidings of Jesus Christ. Uh, he says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good things, that publisheth salvation. The word publish means to proclaim. And whether written, I'm glad for the tracks, but we ought to be proclaiming with our voice as well. It gives us those two different instruments. But uh, again, God has brought these unsaved to our doorsteps. I mean, it used to be where we would say that we're the Bible belt. If anybody knows the Bible, it's us here in the South. I mean, we believe every word through and through. Now you can't find a person who knows anything about it. One thing I know is, one, people are searching, but two, people want to be heard. As many times Sarah and I will be having a conversation and we'll uh, be speaking about something serious. And I'm sitting there and I'm talking with her back and forth and uh, next thing you know, because uh, you know, Elijah's Elijah, he'll come in and he say, excuse me, excuse me. Can, can, mommy, Daddy. I said, well, we're talking right now. We're talking. This is a serious conversation, son. You know what he does? He pull on my coat. There. Excuse me. I'm trying to say something. 
I believe if anybody wants to be heard, I, I'm, I'm glad for a little boy that wants to be heard. I'm glad for preachers who want to be heard. But if anybody wants to be heard, I believe that it's God. Many people have their ideas of what works and what doesn't work. But I tell you, we would do well to hear the Word of God. It's so important that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, or, or, or God, the God of the Bible says in His Word, He tells Isaiah, cry aloud, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. He tells Ezekiel, he says, I've set you to be a watchman to warn the people, and if you don't tell the people about their sins, their blood is upon your hands. He tells the Apostle Paul, now this is what I don't get, you know, Tim Keller not long ago, and written in the New York Times, he says, uh, you know, these people are coming with their worldviews, and what you got to do is take the gospel and retell their story for them. In other words, to me, it sounded like what he was saying was just add Jesus to all their other gods. But the Apostle Paul told him, he says, preach the Word. That's going to be the only thing that's going to help them. They need the Word of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished. Paul says it's the Word of God. It still works. He says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel, for it's the power of God. Under what? salvation. The key to this verse here, to the text, is God wants all men everywhere to be saved. That's the key. Man thinks we've got everything figured out. If there's a natural catastrophe, it must be because of global warming. I, I know why these hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and, and all this is happening is global warming. That's man's answer. They got an answer for crime in the streets. They say, I know what we'll do. All these criminals are going up and shooting up churches, houses, uh, the schools and everything else. We'll put a ban upon guns. That's our answer. They come up and they say, well, we have the answer to the drug problem. We'll give them prescription drugs. They say, i got the answer for a man who, who, who is struggling with his emotions and with his guilt and everything else as they go to the psychologist and they say, just love yourself and go out and take a vacation and everything's going to be all right. They begin to come up with all these different philosophies and it's no more effective. They, they just go out the next day and they say, this is not working. They turn to booze or drugs or whatever have you. There's only one thing that's going to work. There's only going to be one thing that makes a difference. And it's got to be this word. Man's ways are not working. I don't care what the government officials say. I don't care what scholarship says. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, when we come to the best of what we have, our ways are just not working. But God's Word works every single time. Uh, we're constantly looking, seeking uh, for something that will, uh, that will work and to solve our life problems and our life dilemmas, right? Uh, sometimes, I used to work as a mechanic there in Sears, and you know, after a long day of eight hours being in the grease and everything else, it ends up all over your uniform, all over your hands, all over your face and everything else. And you go out there and you, at the end of the day, you take that uh, uh, orange cleaner that they have and you put it there upon your hands and you scrub it. And after the, you wash it all off, guess what? Some of that grease is still there. And it just irritates me that sometimes you have to keep washing and scrubbing your hands for like a day in order for that grease to come on off because it's just all over you. As soon as I come home from McDonald's when I work there, my wife said, take off your clothes, you smell like grease. That grease is all over you. I wish it would work to where I'd just come home and it didn't have to take a shower. I just love on my wife. She says, you're not kissing me until you take that shower first. We want something that works. Something that's going to solve our life problems. I don't, we, we're not looking for the seven-step program that keeps failing. We're not looking for the three-step program that keeps failing. It's like the diets that people go on time and time again. It works for a little while and the next thing you know, they've picked up the weight back again. And they wonder what the problem is. 
And they wonder where they're going to find answers to the broken homes, to the hurting hearts, to the broken hearted. They wonder where we're going to find the problems to our financial situations, to our government, to the world as we know it. We've been laboring, as the Bible says, without satisfaction. And we continue to put our hands to the work as the Apostle or as uh, Solomon had already told us. He says, I've tried everything under the sun. I've worked, I've tried pleasure, I've tried drink, I've tried everything that there is, and I've found that in life that there's nothing more to do than to fear God and to keep His commandments. Nothing in this world has satisfied, nothing in this world has brought pleasure more than the Word of God. And people need to be saved. And people need to turn to Him. But there's nothing more effective for our lives than the ever-living, abiding Word of God. And the Bible says that we were not born again of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible of the Word of God, which liveth, and I'm glad for this, abideth forever. It's continually working in those who are saved. It's still there, so do you be as a tree planted by the rivers of water. There's nothing more effective for our lives than the ever-living Word of God. And the problem's not with the Word. The problem is with who? This guy. This guy. It's not with the Word. It's with me. It's not with the Word. It's because we haven't searched it. It's not with the Word. It's because I haven't meditated upon it. It's not with the Word. It's because I haven't followed it. It's not with the Word. It's because I haven't been trying to do it. It will always, we have the promise of God upon it, accomplish what He pleases and prospers unto the thing whereunto He sent it. And compare your Bible today with the methods of men. Check out the results of God's Word in standing up to man's greatest problems. And you'll find out that it doesn't fare very well. The best that man can do is always shortchanged and we'll find that uh, we'll be inferior every single way. Our books cannot match the wisdom of God. Isn't that true? I mean, we can fill our libraries with every single book under the sun of self-help or soul winning or, or, or theology or whatever the course may be, but none of the wisdom that we have in this world can match to the wisdom of God. It's not as effective as the wisdom of God. Our philosophy can't quiet the questions of the mind. You go to the psychologist all you want to, and, and they may be able to numb the pain and help for a lot while, but only the Word of God can help bring peace and reconciliation with God and change us. The books can't match the wisdom of God. The philosophy can't quiet the noisy soul. The psychology can't bind up the brokenhearted, but God promises to do that. Our programs can't remove the pain of sin, but instead of search for searching for more of the world, we need to be searching more of the Word and living it by faith. The Bible says that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Now, as I've already mentioned, our text comes on the heels of Isaiah 53. I love Isaiah 53. I, I mean, at one time I had it memorized. I don't have it memorized anymore. When we turn over there, everybody says, Wow, this is the song of the suffering servant. We ought to personalize that. This is my suffering servant. But more than that, people, you, we ought not to stop with just the suffering that He endured and taking our sins upon Himself, wounded for our chastisement, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. But it didn't stop with the suffering there in the middle of that, that, that great Isaiah 53 text. He, he ends with the exalted Savior as He ascends to the right hand of God. He's not dead. He liveth, as the apostles proclaimed on the resurrection morning. We see the exalted Savior, and then in the, we hear this when Isaiah asked the question at the beginning of the chapter, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? 
And I can only imagine as Jeremiah and as Isaiah and as many of the other uh, prophets have been preaching and proclaiming many things of which they don't always understand, but yet they're giving the Word of God faithfully and they're telling them that the Chaldeans are coming and they're telling them that God will judge iniquity and God will ha have His way with the lost. With those who've turned their back upon God. The, I mean, the children of Israel are the ones who, who, who have the Word of God, the very Word of God. And yet we find in Israel like the kings of Ahab and Manasseh where they just tossed it to the side and went not found again until Josiah. They had the temples of God and yet they weren't going to worship. They would go into the temple and God showed Ezekiel. He says, they're not worshiping me. They've turned their back upon me. And now they're worshiping the Son and the Queen of Heaven and everything else. But yet these are the ones whom Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah are preaching to. Who hath believed our report? The fact of the matter is that God wants His message of salvation spread far and wide. He didn't just die for the Jews. He died for every single person upon the face of this earth, but the Savior will come through them. That's the message. And then in Isaiah 54, there's great promises that are given there, but here He tells us how He's going to get that Word out. And that's through the giving of His Word. God explains beyond man's greatest comprehension and dreams. God in, the, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, would demonstrate His love for us on the Roman cross and dying in our stead for our sins of the whole world. And this great salvation will be without money. In verse 1 here in our text. And without price. A great transaction will be made. He was judged in our place. A great transformation is going to be wrought. And even as the ground that is dry and there's nothing that's there and it's bare and it seems like there's no fruit that's coming out and God keeps sending the water and sending the water and sometimes something, nothing seems to be happening. But at the same time as He sends down the water, and I'll get to this, and I'm getting ahead of myself. He's able to bring up flowers and grass, dew, well, the dew sits on the flowers. Beautiful things of God's creation. Great transformation will be wrought and all of it's made possible through faith in God's Word that never fails. In verse 1-3, through three, we have a great invitation by God that's totally foreign to every false religion. But everybody's trying to do all the works that they can by this flesh, and yet the best that we can do, Isaiah says, are but filthy rags. I was reading in Jeremiah the other day, and uh, he was telling Jeremiah, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to take that girdle that you have and go and stick it in the Euphrates River. And he left it there for some time, and he pulled it out uh, some days later, and he says, I want you to put that thing around you. I can't imagine somebody going to a dumpster and pulling out some claws and putting them on. That'd feel pretty nasty. All your righteousness are as filthy rags. But God has paved the way through faith. We have nothing to boast in. Paul says, the only thing I have to boast in is in the power of the cross. Like wisdom crying in the street in Proverbs 8, we find here as Isaiah lays out the message. Over and over again, we see the pleadings and the calling of God as He calls out by grace to a lost and dying world, come in here, turn in hither. Behold, come, behold, seek, I got the answer. Do you believe that the Bible is God's answer to man's problems? I do. So he calls. The problem's not with God's calling, the problem was with man's ears. We stopped our ears, we've hardened our hearts, we've turned away from the face of God. Within the chapter. In all of his pleadings and pictures, we come to realize that, hey, we're, we're in a mess. God sets himself apart from man. He's been so far alienated. He says, look, 
You've lived life your own way. You're laboring again. Verse 2. For that which satisfies not. You're spending money and yeah, you're, you're putting food on the grocery table, but that is not the bread that you need in order to live. You need my word. You need what I got for you. And I'll give it to you without money and I'll give it to you without price. But then the Word is a wonderful message of what Christ has done for us. The Bible tells us about our alienation. It says, every man walketh in a vain show. I like that text. Stick their chest out. Look at me. I'm not like other men are. Pretty, pretty good. Don't ask my wife though because she might give you a different story. But according to the world... I'm good. I don't do what they do. I'm not at the bars. I'm not doing this. I'm not messing around. I'm doing all the right things. I show up at church. Every man walketh in a vain show, an empty show. In other words, they're only impressing themselves. God looks at man on the earth and He understands like in Genesis 6, He says this, that every imagination of the thoughts and the intents of the heart are only evil continually. Guess what? The story hasn't changed. People wonder how somebody could go out and commit some of the crimes that they do. Well, God has the answer. The imaginations of their hearts are only evil continually. Well, how can this happen in the world? Because of our hearts. He says that every man's corrupted their way upon the earth before he sends the flood. He declares in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And all our so-called righteousness are as filthy rags. God, on the other hand, we don't measure up to His holiness. We're nowhere close to where He is, but yet He, he reaches down and He tries to bring us up to where He is and offer us to help. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to be changed. He wants us to be transformed. He wants us to have the peace and the help and the peace that passes all understanding. I think for many men, this is what, according to their actions, they may not say it in their words. God needs me. God needs me. Now, I've never heard anybody physically come out and say it that way. There's been none of you or anybody else that I've known through the course of my short life of 39 years that says, God needs me. Sometimes we act like it in ministry, I guess, because you know, you're like, if I don't do the work, then it's not going to be done. God needs me. But the fact of the matter is that when we come to the Word of God, we find out that it's us who needs God and say, Lord, I need You every hour. Lord, I can't go a day without messing up. I can't go a day without thinking the wrong thoughts. I can't go a day without offending somebody. I can't go a day without fixing, without messing up my, my life. It's us who needs God. I was helping with a roofing job. I used to do a little bit of roofing, shingles, and all of this. Not the shingles on the skin, but on the roof. And, uh, you know, I learned to conquer some of my fears of heights. Not all of them, but some of them. And uh, we had this one house, nice fancy house. They had plenty of money, I think. They had one of these dormers coming off of the house, and uh, the owner wanted us to put on a copper copper roof on top of it. You know, it's nice and shiny. I thought to myself, every single copper roof turns green. I don't know if I would want that on top of my house. Even though my favorite color is green, by the way. I still don't think that's the right thing to do. We had spent a whole day, a small dormer wasn't very big, a whole day. Now, I was only the helper. I wasn't the one that did the work, but we had to shape everything by hand. Every, I mean, the ridges every piece of this by hand and I'm sitting there watching as I'm handing the pieces of metal and cutting as exactly as he wants me to cut and we had labored all day in order to get this this copper roof put on according to what the owner we thought wanted the very next day my boss gets a phone call and he says I don't want that roof on there I want you to tear it off 
What do you mean? It looks good. It looks great. It's wonderful. We've labored. We've tried. We've, we've, I mean, everything short of doing a miracle. I think it looks good. I couldn't find a flaw or imperfection. Keep in mind, I'm not perfect, but the guy that I was working with, he was really good. But the boss, uh, the owner of the house said, that's not what I want. Many times we go to God with that same sort of mentality. Look at what I've done and what I've accomplished. He says, that's not what I want. It's not what I've asked for. And so what are we to do? Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. Verse 3. John says it this way, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and should not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The word of the one who spoke the world into existence. I'd say it works. The one who keeps everything in perfect working order, I mean, God has not been unfaithful in sending up the Son. Some man asked this morning, he says, I don't see the Son. It's still there. The same God that sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross so that we might be saved and and have a home in heaven and be forgiven of all those sins and and, uh, deal with... It's just like in the book of of Hebrews, this is where, where Paul, which we believe to be the writer there of the book of Hebrews. He tells him, he said, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't cleanse the conscience, couldn't, couldn't take away the, possibly take away the sins of the world. But what Jesus Christ has accomplished, when, when He made sure our salvation, when He entered into the holy place by two immutable promises, He gave us a sure, a very sure hope, an anchor of the soul, is what the Bible says. I'd say if he does that, and he did, then we have a pretty short word. The one who uh, told Ezekiel to prophesy unto the dry bones, remember this? He sends Ezekiel out and he says, I want you to call out into the four corners of the earth. The next thing you know, you see, it's just like uh, the, the old song, the, the leg bone is connected to the knee bone and on all, all the way up. I, I forget the song. It's been so long. I'm old now. I'm feeble in mind. But uh, nonetheless, all the bones come together. The, 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 the sinews, the muscle, all of it comes together. I mean, if God can do that, He can do just about anything. You see what I'm saying? Now, we've struggled so long to do it our own way. We've got to realize our way is not working. Our way has not profited us one bit. Many people do everything that they can to try to avoid turning to God. Well, let's cut to the chase and stop making our mistakes and turn unto the Savior. Turn unto the One who can change our world around. We call upon Him for, to be our great physician. We call upon Him to hear and to answer our prayers. Lord, deliver me. We call upon Him for everything. We can trust Him with our life, I believe. That same guy gave us His Word and He wants us to know His Word works. It will accomplish exactly what He pleases and prosper in the thing whereunto He sent it. The Word. God compares His Word in our text to the rain and to the snow. They're so natural to the world in which we live in, we kind of take it for granted. And, and God here is making a comparison to the rain and to the snow, comparing it with His Word. As He sends down the rain and the snow, I mean, God is good in sending this. Everywhere that we turn to in the Scriptures, when Paul preaches upon Mars Hill, he points to the God of creation and says, Look, He is the one who sent the rain in His season. And He is the one who keeps the world in this perfect order. That's the God that I want to proclaim to you. That's the one that we got to turn to. One day He's going to judge the world. And the fact that He raised up His Son from the dead. One day He's going to judge the world by that man. 
And over and over again, he'll use this creation to, to, to show us the, the effectiveness of his word continually in his perfect word. He's able to bring forth fruit and bud every single time. God's word works. Ruth, when we look at that book, we see where God has visited His people and given them bread. Job said that it was God who gave, giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields. James tells us every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above. Now on the opposite end of it, we realize that uh, in the years of Elijah, there was a time where there was a famine, three and a half years without any rain, and that was what? Judgment upon this earth. When He sends the rain, it's the blessing. And here He's sending the greatest message ever heard among men. It comes down from God. There's something else that came down from God. Jesus says, I'm the true bread of he heaven. I'm the one that you need. I'm the one you need to receive. This bread without price and without money that you need to uh, receive. The book of Deuteronomy has an allusion to this verse. In 32 verses 1-2, through 2, it says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, my words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew. And this is a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of our Lord, ascribe ye greatness to our God. That's what He wants us to do. God, you're great. You've done everything in my life. I have nothing to boast of. But just as the hymn writer would say, nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Everything that I have is because you've added it unto me. You've removed the hurts. You've removed the pain. You've set my feet upon a solid rock instead of the slippery places. Let's come down through again. You know, I want to skip some of this here. But God speaks to Job of His faithfulness, of His infinite wisdom, of His infinite power, of His sovereignty, and of His presence. That's when He asked Job to stand before Him and be a man. When He begins to gripe and complain about the things that are happening to Him upon the earth, God says, I want you to stand before Me. He sends forth, the, I mean, just everything about His creation. Job, were you there? Job, were you able to do this? Job, uh, can you make the take care of the Leviathan? Job, can you call out the Pilates? Job, can you loose the belt of Orion? Job, can you make the beautiful snow? Do you know who the father of the rain is? Job, do you know any of this? I can do all things. I'm able to sustain. I'm able to take care. I'm able to provide. Just come to me. Up until that time, I, I don't know if I would have wanted to spend so much time with the miserable comforters who kept telling them, I would have just, like, you know, I had enough of this. I'm going to seek the Lord while He may be found. God has gifted us with so much potential. You know, I think it was last year Sarah wanted a garden. And I go out there and I tilt up the ground. You know, this is for Mother's Day and I'm just getting the ground going and uh, Brother Ken helped me out. We got some stones and we got some dirt to put in and, and uh, I was going to make a nice flower garden for Sarah. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it. There's nothing there. It's bare. Sarah gets a whole bunch of wildflower flower seeds. She buys it in the mail and I say, honey, you know what those are? She said, no, I just know it's wildflowers. <laughs> so, well, okay. And I'm watching her and, uh, you know, normally I, I'm of the persuasion because my father taught me, he says, you go out, you stick your finger into the ground about an eighth of an inch and that seed's got to go into the ground. She's just... Psh, 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 psh. 
I'm like, honey, you want to bury those a little bit? <laughs> he looks down and he sees the ground. But more than that, he sees the potential of what it can be when he sends down the, the rain and the snow from heaven and, and is able to bring forth that nourishment and bring forth the life out of it. And he looks down at us and he says, no, we, you and I can see somebody and it might not be somebody that we think, oh, well, he's from Afghanistan. He must be the Taliban. You know, we should never think that, by the way. <laughs> um... That person's far from being lost. You know what God says? I died for that guy. I see the potential of what my word can do for him. There's been plenty of Muslims who have turned to the Lord. There's been plenty of Catholics who have looked up to the Savior. There's been people whose lives have been touched by this perfect word of God. It's still working. It's still working. Sometimes we struggle because, you know, we go out in the, in the parking lot here and maybe you go out by the uh, basketball area and you see that you got grass all over the place, but in this one area there's nothing. But you know what? God still sends the rain on that bare area as well as on the grass. It'll accomplish what it pleases. If anything else, it'll soften the earth so that the, the sea can get in that seed of faith. Sometimes it's like Matthew says, and he says, when God sows the word of God, the devil will come and snatch it away, or it'll fall upon rocks, or it'll fall upon thorns, or what have you. That doesn't mean we don't have to keep sowing. God's Word produces the fruit. Some of the fruit that He produces uh, that comes up out of the ground may not be what we hope for. It's what's in the ground. As I look at verse 13, it says, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Initially in that ground, God is saying there was a thorn bush that was there. Initially in the ground, there was the briar. All those are reminiscent of the curse that was upon the face of this earth. When God cursed the ground, ever since that time, go with me over to the book of Romans. Chapter 8. Look at verse 18. It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's an amazing when God looks down. He gives us another day. He gives us another year. He gives us more time to turn and to trust. He says, yeah, I know that the world was subject to vanity and this has been going on since the beginning of time. There's going to be people who's going to bring forth the corrupt trees. And, uh, but God's day is coming. John the Baptist said the axe is laid to the root, right? And there's going to be good trees. And you'll know them by their fruit. Well, it's, uh, man, I, you got a long-winded preacher. I'd fire him if I was you. Uh, no, don't fire me. But uh, uh, Over in Proverbs chapter 1, no, Psalms 1. God says... Let me turn it over there so I don't misquote it. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He should be, he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of what? Water. That's the same thing that he says in Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters and drink. That's the same thing that he's saying with his word. It comes down as rain and as snow from heaven and covers as like a blanket over top. You know, Though your sins be red like crimson, I'll make them white as snow. Isn't that what he says? It should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth this fruit in the season. How many of you want to be fruitful? I don't know about you, but it's me. His leaf also should not wither as long as we stay in the water, stay in the Word. And get washed by... There's so many scriptures. Lord, can I preach all day? But the ungodly are not so, but they're like chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly should not stand in the judgment nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Folks, the Word still works. God has blessed you to be saved, to mature, and to grow. He uses the illustration of water because that water brings forth life. He uses the illustration of milk. Come you buy wine and milk without money, without price, because milk, Peter says, as newborn babes desire you the sincere milk of the Word, that we might grow thereby into maturity. The wine there is usually given to somebody of a broken heart or uh, hurting or wounded or what have you. And to bind up the broken hearted. But God has given us the Word and He's planted it so much so not that we could sit in a seat or not that we carry around the Bible and say, well, I have the Word of God. It's not for you to possess it. But it's for the Word to possess you. And every single, I mean, it's to be in your heart every single bit of it. You're to live by it. It's going to make you successful. It's going to help you to grow. It's going to help you to mature. But not if you're not in it. James says, you know, faith without works is dead. There's plenty of people that will scream all day about their faith. But where's the works? I don't see any fruit coming up out of the ground. And once we mature and grow, that seed begins to form. They might give seed to the sower. What are we to be? Sowers of the Word of God. Just as you were blessed by the Word of God to be saved by the grace of God, we're to go out and to spread that seed and to get it out to as many people as we can because it's the greatest message in all the world and we desire for... Hold your ears, Miss Joyce. People like Nancy Pelosi to even get saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we've got to be sowing the seed. There's got to be a decision to, to say, I'm going to be a sower. I'm going to be inviting people to the revival. I want people to be saved. I'll disciple. I'll do all that I can. You know... Sometimes we're looking for the results. Brother Cook, he encouraged me one time, just a year after he was here, I think. He says, you know, I never preach without expecting God to do something. One man sows, another man waters. But God gives the increase. It's not what I do. It's what God does. It's not what you do, Brother Adams. It's what God does. It's not what you do, Brother Frank. It's what God does. If it's up to me, I'll mess it up. And then you minister bread to the eaters. The man who goes out and he plows a field and he works it. Farmer brings forth a nice crop. He ought to be able to partake of all of his labors. 
And God's Word is good, is it not? We could be in here for a very long time, but I'm grateful that He could take that curse and turn us into a blessing. I'm glad that as we are planted by the rivers of water that we can produce fruit in our season. Our leaves should not wither. I hope this was an encouragement to you this morning. Uh, that's what I've intended it to be. But if anybody's not saved, there's your answer right here. God has sent a Savior into the world so that all men might be saved. Because of that, we need to be spreading the gospel as well. There's got to be a decision to say, you know what, today I'm going to reach somebody. Today I want to scatter that seed. The same seed that God gave to me, I want to scatter it. I want to help somebody. we got to make those decisions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for this morning and for Your Word. And just thank You that, uh, Lord, this is not man's wisdom. And it's not what man can do, but it's what You can do. I look around at all the results and things You were able to accomplish, both in this world and in my life personally, and I can say, Lord, You've done great things. There's no way that I could have imagined what You would do in my life the day that You saved me. They called me to be a preacher of the Gospel. Lord, it's amazing to think, just as David would say in Psalm number 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him? But yet, You sow those seeds of peace and hope. Lord, thank You so much for Your Word. And I pray that it would just take root in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We want to sing hymn number 390. 390. Have I done my best for Jesus? Three ninety. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus, who died upon the cruel tree? To think of His great sacrifice at Calvary, I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when He has done so much for me? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening. And if I can be a help of any way, you let me know, all right? Uh, Brother Coon, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here all together together. Father, we thank you that we can listen to what we know is true, your word, the Lord, and our hand. Father, we thank you that we just sat down and thought about it a while. We could thank you for a long time, all the many blessings that you poured upon us, out upon us that we don't even deserve. Father, your protection, Father, your grace and your mercy and father we guarantee those that put our faith and our trust in the death burial and resurrection, the resurrection of jesus christ we guarantee the place in heaven father we thank you for that privilege to be called your son amen god is good all the time Amen. Pass out.